I'm Amanda Leitner, and welcome to Rochester Rising, where we amplify the stories of Rochester entrepreneurs. Welcome to episode 250 of the podcast. Thank you so much for deciding to spend some of your time with us today to learn more about small business and the culture of entrepreneurship here in Rochester, Minnesota. We hope that you learned something today from entrepreneurs themselves that can help with your own journey. Here at Rochester Rising, we release a podcast each Wednesday. You can find the podcast on our website or wherever you listen in to podcasts, especially Apple Podcasts and Spotify. We also have a special playlist for our podcast on the Rochester Rising YouTube channel. You can find links to all of those things through our show notes, so check it out. We also have, in addition to our podcast, tons of articles and videos on our website telling the experience of both very new and very experienced business owners. You can find all of that on the Rochester Rising homepage. So check the links in our bio to easily get to all of that information. Here at Rochester Rising, we're a part of a larger organization called Collider, which is a Rochester-based nonprofit that activates, connects, and empowers early-stage entrepreneurs in the community. You can learn more about Collider and how this organization can help accelerate and assist your entrepreneurial journey at Collider.mn. Rochester Rising was started in 2016 to tell stories of entrepreneurship taking place within the city of Rochester, Minnesota. We take a lot of pride in telling stories that we feel otherwise would not have been told and take a lot of time to understand each entrepreneur and what their experience has really been like in this community. If you find value in this podcast, if you feel that you learn something every time you listen in, please consider donating to Rochester Rising so that we can keep telling these stories. If you find value in this podcast and want to keep it going, please click the link in our show notes to donate today, or you can navigate to that on our homepage as well. So this week on podcast episode 250, I got the opportunity to talk to John Seavers. This Davenport, Iowa native is a father, husband, and trombonist, among many other things, who loves to make live music. John grew up in a very musical family. His family now is musical as well. So we have a great conversation about John's work, the many hats he wears in the community, especially his music career. We chat about how uh, everything started with John from a trombone. He brought it, bought it a garage sale during his childhood. We talk a lot about his work with the Deceivers, which he's probably best known for. The Deceivers are a small jazz group uh, in Rochester where he plays the trombone. We also talk a lot about his work as a freelance musician and what he thinks it takes to be successful including a lot of the different bands that he plays with. We talk about how he started growing and gigging his music career here in the community, how he manages this as a business, how he built up a following, and what keeps bringing him back to this type of work. So we have a great conversation to share it with you today, so stick around until the end. Before we launch into today's podcast, we just wanted to acknowledge our sponsor, Clifton Larson Allen, or CLA. The team at CLA would love to get to know you, learn about your vision, and see if they can help. CLA is a full-service CPA firm with over 100 offices nationally, including right here in Rochester. Sure, they do taxes and audits, but they also focus on helping startups refine their vision, build budgets, work with banks and investors, and track and organize their accounting. They are deeply experienced in building the business systems that allow you to focus on what you do best, get product market fit, growing sales, hiring talent, and creating a thriving enterprise. Contact Todd Churchill at todd.churchill at claconnect.com or give him a call at 507-280-2317. All right, so now on to the podcast with John Sievers. All right. Well, John, thanks so much for, for being here today, connecting over Zoom. I appreciate your time this afternoon. Yeah, glad to be here and looking forward to our conversation. Yeah. So I just wanted to start off by having you share a little bit about yourself. So kind of what's your background? What's your interests? Um, is there something you want to share that a lot of people don't know about you? Well, I don't know about that, but... Um... <laughs> 
my, my name is John Sievers, and I am a father and a husband, and I play trombone, and I love making live music, but I'm also a college um, English professor at uh, Rochester Community Technical College, and I also do some freelance writing for uh, mainly for the Rochester Post Bulletin, but some other publications as well. Um, I've been living in Rochester for uh, a good a good spell here. Um, moved here because my wife got a, a job at uh, the Mayo Clinic, Beth Sievers, and uh, been living here since then and kind of worked my way to get my doctorate degree in English literature during that time and have taught at some various community colleges. And obviously I pursued a lot of music opportunities as well, uh, specifically one of the main my main projects or groups is called the deceivers, which is a, a jazz group. And I play trombone in that group. So it's a little bit about who I am, I guess. So where are you from originally that in the Midwest or somewhere else? Yeah. Uh, I grew up in the quad cities in Iowa. So in Davenport specifically, and that's just about, I don't know, four and a half hours, um, South of here roughly. So, yeah. Yep. That's still kind of far though. Four and a half hours is still, still a drive. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, I wanted to dive into all of that a little bit because, yeah, you wear a lot of different hats, like you were saying, from being a musician to being in this this jazz band to being a freelance musician to writing to teaching English. Um, but I want to understand to start, what's your history with music? How did you get started? How did you kind of land on trombone? Oh, sure. Um, well... It all went back to the fateful day when I was at a yard sale with my mom and dad, and there was a garage sale for twenty dollars at uh, the, you know, and I was, I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And my parents loved music. My dad, Dennis, and my mom, Celeste. She's passed away now, but both of them were music lovers. My mom always played piano, and my dad played guitar, and we just had a plethora of musical instruments at our house. They always bought them, whether someone was playing them or not, and. $20 or maybe $25 trombone, I don't know, came home. And then uh, in the elementary I went to was Monroe Elementary School. Um, you know, we started in the summer of fifth, fifth grade and um, took band lessons and learned how to play trombone and played all through middle school and high school. Um, really, like during middle school, got super interested in jazz, started playing in some community ensembles which were mostly you know older much older people than than I um and enjoyed that a lot there's one I played in called the the kicks orchestra and we would do like I don't know like we did the grand opening of the riverboat casinos and stuff like that so it was always kind of interesting because as a younger person um you know sometimes I was getting to go into some places and spaces that I, I wouldn't normally have been allowed into um, and, uh, you know, my dad was always taking me out to listen to live music and just loved it a lot. And then in, uh, high school, I started playing in a, a rock band with my fellow high school students called, um, uh, let's see, Ryan and the tonsil snails was the name of that band. And we, uh, played like a lot of dances and stuff and just enjoyed that. And then from there, in college, I wanted to study um, music, and I was trying to think of a way that maybe I could make my living with music because I really loved it. So I um, decided to, I wanted to become a band teacher, and I got uh, I started out at University of Northern Iowa studying um, music education. Um, in the course of that, I decided that in fact I did not want to be a band teacher. Um, and I pretty much finished that degree and actually got certified to teach music in the state of Iowa, um, but didn't get, I got just a music minor rather than, and I, and I switched in the middle to do like English education, still loving music, but just thinking that I never wanted to have to teach anyone how to play bassoon. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's kind of how the musical side of things came about for me. And then, um, you know, all through um, college, I, I played in, in different bands and, and recorded records like with the Northern Iowa's Jazz One and just loved that experience. And then, um, you know, I've, I've kept going with music in a whole variety of ways since then. 
Very cool. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the deceivers. Sure. For people not familiar with it, can you explain what it is and where can people find you around town and on and on online as well? Yeah. So um, the Deceivers is a small jazz group. So um, you know, it might be as small as a duo, and it might go up to like you know a quintet or a sextet, depending on what the occasions are. Um, but most frequently, especially lately, um, it's a small, a smaller group like a duo or a trio, just because that's the opportunities that that are easiest for us to fill. So we play jazz music, which really features a lot of improvisation. Um, we're doing a lot of standards. So we're playing everything from uh, you know bossa novas to blues and bebop tunes, um, but we're doing a lot of jazz standards. We also do some originals that that we've written. Um, the makeup of the group changes from gig to gig. I kind of have a core of, you know, I don't know, about eight people that I, I play with frequently. And typically the only thing that you're really sure of when the deceivers come to play is that I'm going to be there. Um, and then, and actually there's been a few cases where the deceivers played and I couldn't even be there because of a uh, last minute emergency. So those have been few and far between. Um, but uh, we do a lot of events like weddings and grand openings, and we play a lot at restaurants and breweries and things of that nature. Um, we also uh, host with the quartet like a monthly jazz jam at Forager Brewery, which is a lot of fun. And we kind of invite people to come in and sit in with the band on a, a couple of, of jazz standards. So we get singers and instrumentalists and drummers and bass players and piano players to kind of come and make a makeshift um, ensemble and perform a song along with the deceivers. And that, that typically that's on the fourth Sunday. So that's something that we do regularly. Um, but, you know, typically the deceivers are playing anywhere from, you know, four to eight times a month. Um, and obviously like the pandemic has disrupted that to some extent. Um, but it, things are, are coming back pretty well now and, and hopefully that will continue to be the case. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, a lot of the live music, a lot of these gatherings are slowly starting back up again, which has to be a really good feeling uh, for you to get out there, interact with people, play music, which is, you know, what drives you to do this too. Yeah, definitely. Though, of course, you always want to be safe about it too, right. you know? I mean, like, I don't want to be putting myself at risk and my family at risk, and I also don't want to be putting other people at risk. So it's all kind of a, a balancing act to see what what makes sense at the current moment. So that's definitely been a, a struggle over the last, you know, last couple of, couple of uh, actually now it's starting to be years almost, you know, so... <laughs> Um, but I was thinking about that t today. I was like, it's probably been like two years since this has been in existence now. Definitely um, get, yeah, this definitely virus. get to that, that point, yeah. Yeah, in the world at least, yeah. Um, so you do some uh, freelance work as a freelance musician as well um, with other groups. Do you find, do you, are you most, do you spend most of your time with the deceivers? Is it most of the time as a freelance musician? musician what's that kind of balance like for you yeah i mean it's 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 um you know i love making music and i do music because i i really enjoy it um so i play in any and all opportunities that that make sense for me to do so um another group that i play in a lot is called loudmouth brass um and you know we can do different sorts of things and the deceivers can you know, it's a larger group. It's a little more high energy group. So, um, you know, one of the key things I think to, to being successful um, as a musician is being flexible and having like a lot of variety to what you might be able to offer. And even though I only play trombone, I try to play trombone in as many different, you know, ways as I as I can. So that um, La Mouth Brass is another group. We play like kind of New Orleans pop instrumental music, and that's a lot of fun. Um, but, you know, there's uh, a variety of other groups that I play with on a regular basis. Uh, one of my newest projects is I'm playing with um, Lasagna's band, uh, The Soul Train. We just did a big Halloween party, which was a lot of fun. And so that's kind of more of like a, a, a rock and funk cover band with a horn section. Um, and I really like that. But I also play with like uh, an Americana band called Jagged Ease quite a bit. Um, 
play in another rock band called After School Special uh, now and again. I do a lot of just like freelance playing for like churches and stuff like that. Like this Sunday, I'll be uh, doing a uh, part of a jazz service at Gloria Day um, Church. So, um, you know, and then there's some other projects that I play in that are regular, but not as, as frequent. There's the John Paulson Big Band, which is um, based in uh, Winona and we play like original big band music and that does a couple things a year. I also play in um, a Beatles uh, tribute band called the Shabby Road Orchestra and that plays more like in the Minneapolis kind of area. So, um, you know, each year recently where it's been an anniversary year for a Beatles album, we've like played that album in its entirety um, and like in that group, like I'm a pretty small, uh, you know, cog in a, in a big, in a big machine. Um, but just like having all that variety is, is exciting and I really enjoy it and it keeps me busy, you know, making, making music and, and, and getting paid to do something that I really love. I think that's a good point though, like, you know, to be successful or to give yourself the best chance to be successful, being adaptable, being flexible being able to kind of go into different situations as long as it plays your strength and something that you enjoy, you know, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think too, that, um, you know, oftentimes things lead to other things too. And you never know like who you're going to meet in one of those playing situations or, um, you know, what, what other opportunities they might be interested in, in having you be part of. So it's always nice to, to try to keep your, opportunities as wide as you, as, as you can. Um, and, and I, and I really, you know, I love making music. I do. Uh, I love, I love teaching and I love writing. Um, but I really do love making music. So this is something for me that is, um, you know, a, a passion that I just, I, I kind of have to, I kind of have to do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I hear that. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about, what you were just saying. Um, I think a lot of people listening probably are interested in, in starting music career. So I was interested to learn more about how you started gigging. You know, you talked a little bit about being open to opportunities. How did you get started? How did that kind of grow? How did it go from, yeah. you know, I'm doing this for fun to now I'm getting paid. What did that look like for you? Yeah. I mean, and I guess I would say specifically that, um, I, 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 I am doing this for fun and I am also getting paid. And those two things are, are, you know, maybe equally important to me and they might not be for, for every entrepreneur, you know, um, I do have, uh, you know, a steady income from my teaching job. So I'm definitely not dependent upon the income that I make from music. That being said, the income I make from music is significant and, um, and is important to me. Um, I mean, like, so for me, it really started when I was young, right? I mean, like my first paying gigs happened in like middle school and, and high school, right? And, you know, so through that experience of, uh, okay, well, how does this situation come about? You know, you, you find an a opportunity where you might be able to play, you make a contract with someone, you know, I mean, just like seeing how other people that hired me to play for them went about doing it. I just learned a lot about how that how that happens. Um, I mean, here in Rochester specifically, you know, it's like you 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 have to get started somewhere. So here, the first musical thing that I did in town actually was I played with um, a band called Swing Street, which is a big band. And it still exists and makes music. I'm not I'm not a, a full time member of that band anymore, but it's a it's a great band. But I, I they needed a trombone player. I joined the band. I started meeting people in the music community, um, and then uh, from there, you know, I could see like, oh well, you know, there's not a lot of work for a 16 piece big band in Rochester, right? Like it's hard to find. Uh, regular opportunities to play for that. Um, in the warm months, it's easier. Otherwise you're doing big events like wedding receptions and, and things like that, that are kind of maybe more one-offs. So I tried to just find some ways where I could have more opportunities to play. And one of the first things I did was I started this group called the deceivers, 
um, which was just uh, still doing jazz like I love, but it was much smaller and more flexible so that we could play at a restaurant or we could play at, um, you know, your neighborhood party or we could play in your house for a dance opportunity. And, and really that, that ability of like the deceivers to change in size um, is really important, you know, so that we can do different sorts of things. So um, just making a lot of community connections with like different um, restaurants and uh, different kind of, you know, like the Rochester Downtown Association or Threshold Arts or um, just like local arts um, organizations, the, the Rochester Civic Theater, uh, you know, do, doing different music events for them. And I mean, a lot of it is just like meeting people, understanding how music might be something that is important to them or might fit in with their business plan. And then, um, you know, trying to just offer a suggestion of, hey, maybe you would want to, you know, hire the deceivers or, um, you know, hire one of these other groups. I mean, and that's always nice, too, uh, to say, you know, well, this specific group that I play in, well, maybe that's not what you want um, for your event. But, hey, here's like five other things that I play in. Maybe one of those is going to work. And that sort of flexibility has all been part of, you know, what's made me able to, to, to make music as a, as a freelance musician in, in Rochester. Yeah. So I talked to a lot of different people on this podcast, but a pretty common thread is, you know, a lot of people like to be, you know, in the business doing the thing that they want to do, like in your case, playing the gigs, mm -hmm. but there's a whole backside to that where it's actually, you know, managing that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what does that look like for you? What did you have to put in place um, to get to, go and play the music then what makes it work as kind of a, a business for you yeah um you know so the the sort of management stuff that i'm doing on a regular basis is like you know i'm doing like kind of um weekly assessments of okay what am i playing this week um which of those events are events that like i'm the lead person for so where I have hired other people to play for me, which of those events am I, you know, have I been hired to play by someone else? And then just making sure that you're doing all the, the record keeping and communication with, uh, you know, contracts and other things like that to make sure that you're getting people to show up when they said they were going to show up and you're doing what you promised to do. You know, I mean, I guess I think like the key things that you know you need to be successful in doing this are you know you gotta you have to be flexible and be willing to do different stuff you also have to be like just really organized and um you know like uh, follow through like if you promise that you're going to do something like you got to follow through on it every time and a lot of that involves just making sure that you know you know what you promise you're going to do so you know keeping track of those contracts even if they're only verbal contracts, you know, um, and knowing and having a good record of, of, um, what it is that you said that you're going to do. Um, you know, so on a weekly basis, I'm kind of assessing, okay, what's coming up this week. Who do I have to, to get in touch with? Do I have to make sure that, you know, the, the mask mandate hasn't changed our playing situation or, you know, I mean, like say when COVID rolled around, you know, there's so many times where I had to like, email people saying, yeah, this thing that I promised that I was going to hire you to do is falling through and, um, you know, and, and all that sort of communication, that's a big part of like the management that's, that's happening. Um, and then just like realizing too, like, um, you know, like what musicians can I hire and what, what things do they need to have happen in order for them to be able to play? You know, I mean, like, do they, do they have some disabilities so that, that like a stage needs to be a certain way for them to access it? I mean, and all that sort of stuff too, uh, is, is been you know, stuff that I have to think about and consider as well. So I don't know if I'm answering your question fully, but there's, I mean, there's just like a lot of moving pieces and a lot of yeah. it just depends on good record keeping and like good communication skills and, and, you know, just keeping all those lines of communication open. Yeah, that was exactly what I was going to say. It's, there's a lot of moving pieces there and it's keeping it all like in line and, and organized and yeah, just having a system that works for you um, to do that. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you a little bit about kind of building up your following because I think, you know, a lot of times when people, like if we're talking about a business, you know, you're trying to get customers with probably you have no money, um, with a, with a band, you know, you're getting the customers, you're 
venues that you're playing at and you're getting the following, you know, Mm -hmm. how do you, you know, especially when you're starting out, you have pretty much no money to do any kind of advertising or anything. How did you raise awareness of you as a musician, the various bands that you're in, in the community, what was kind of successful for you? Sure. Um, you know, I don't know if I have the, the, the secret bullet for, for making that happen. Nobody and, does. And, and if I, <laughs> and if I did, I, I might, you know, be a full-time musician rather than a part-time musician, you know, um, you know, I guess I've done like, I've tried to do a lot of things that are, um, inexpensive, um, but like interesting. I mean, like one example might be, uh, I got a bunch of like temporary tattoos made with the deceivers logo on it. Um, which actually is a, a beautiful logo that my friend Mike King, who's a medical illustrator for the clinic made for me. And it's got a mermaid on it because I, I have a thing for mermaids. I love mermaids my doctoral dissertation actually has to do with mermaids which is a a musical symbol but anyways on this tattoo it's got a mermaid that's like playing trombone it says the deceiver so um there's a lot of uh, gigs that i would go to and people are having a a good time at a restaurant or something i'd be like oh i've got these temporary tattoos and then people would put them on and like take a picture or whatever and post it on social media and you know i mean that tattoo cost me like I don't know, sense or something, you know, and, and so I'm happy to give them away. And then people get kind of excited about it and, and do something with it that then maybe spreads um, awareness about, you know, like my, my band or, or whatever. I mean, I think a lot of it also is just like, um, I mean, there's all the things that, that bands always do, like make t-shirts, you know, I don't know how many different varieties of deceivers t-shirts I've made now. And, uh, I'm, and you're, you're selling those, but you're really, not making any money on them in my experience, at least, you know, I mean, you're not, you're probably not losing money on them, but you're just trying to get people to maybe wear those t-shirts and, and raise some awareness. Um, I also think that's like really important to support like just live music in general, you know, and the arts more widely because all those opportunities for other bands and other artists lead to more opportunities for you. You know, I mean, like, um, I, I, I'm a firm believer in the idea that a rising tide, you know, like floats all boats or all bands, maybe I should say screwing up that saying, but, um, you know, so like I try to support other musicians as much as I can, um, you know, no matter what type of music they're playing. Um, and, and I found that that, um, support goes a long way to creating awareness about like what, what I do. You know, I mean, I can't, I, I don't know if I can even count like the number of um, people's recordings that I have, you know, made a little cameo on. Um, and I'm just, I, I love to do that. And I love to collaborate with people. So I think collaboration is key, um, you know, trying to collaborate with, with other musicians. I mean, that's one of the things I really love about music, especially like, as a trombone player. Um, you don't see me going out and doing like solo trombone shows you know as much as I wish I could make that work no one seems to want to see like a solo trombone show so um you know it's it's all about that that collaboration uh, especially for me and there's just like interesting uh, musical communication that happens between you and someone else when you're trying to make music and and I think that really lends itself to this like creating awareness of you in a community in a music community um you know i also try to um i mean a lot of the writing that i've done has not not all of it but much of it has been focused on the arts and on music um and i and i think that's important to you know getting to know people and um, trying to make other uh, musicians and artists successful so that's all part of that uh, you know kind of building your brand i guess uh, as well um I mean, so those are some of the things, certainly not all the things I do, but, you know, uh, from the tattoos to the t-shirts to, uh, to, to just like networking. I mean, that's really like how you get the word out there and, and find the people that are into what you're into and want to come out and support you and, and see you. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, I love the temporary tattoo idea. Um, I mean, and, that, and that's so fun too, because like, yeah. we'll, we'll get like, you know, like little, I'll be playing like a community event with a bunch of little kids. And actually I, I made coloring sheets before and, and the kids love that. But then also too, like, you'll be at a, 
a bar or something and older people just kind of start having fun, having fun with that too, uh, as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we talked about this a little bit, you know, you're, you're a musician, you teach English as well at the college level, you do freelance writing a lot in in arts and culture. So a lot of different hats. How does it fit together for you? What do you get out of those different roles? that adds to, to what you want to be in life. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, all those different roles, you know, and, and not to mention the, all the personal roles that I'm playing too, right. you know, as, as, as a father and a, and a husband, um, you know, they, they, they just, I think for me, it's like just having that variety of different things to be involved in is exciting. I'm a curious person. I like to learn about new things. Um, and you know, by, by doing a variety of different sorts of, of work, um, you just have more opportunities to change up what you're doing, you know? Um, you know, for instance, like when I'm at, when I'm working at Rochester Community Technical College, I love interacting with students and I love, you know, trying to do my best to guide them to be good writers I don't always, I'll be honest, I don't always love grading a stack of like 90 essays. Like I I don't always love that. And it's nice to, you know, get done with that 15th essay that you graded that day and, um, you know, have something to creative maybe to, to put your energies into like playing a gig. So it's nice to have that opportunity to like change up, um, how you are engaging with your, your professional um, environment. So that, that's really like one of the main reasons why I like to maybe be doing different things um, is for that, that sort of variety. I don't know if that completely answers your question, but. No, I think so. I, I totally agree. I'm a type of person who needs to be doing different, a lot of different things or else it gets kind of boring for me. Yeah. <laughs> Do your kids come to your, to watch you play at all? Oh, they do. They do sometimes. And, and, uh, sometimes they don't. (laughs) Depends depends, on where you are. (laughs) Yeah. It depends on where I, where I am. And, and and as they're getting older, so my, um, daughters are are 14 and 12 now, Eleanor and Abigail. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're developing their own interests and, and pursuits. And I'm excited to encourage those. My daughter, Eleanor just recently played, some original music that she wrote at the open mic at Forager. So that was cool to see. Um, and she does a lot of like guitar and um, saxophone and ukulele and singing. And then my other daughter, Abigail, is, a, is learning how to play bass. And so it's fun to see where those interests um, connect with mine. Though I've been pretty careful not to be like, oh, you have to, you should do music or something like that. Like I have tried to avoid uh, being prescriptive about that um yeah that's super cool though do you ever play together oh yeah there yeah. <laughs> you know I try I I've tried to make that happen a couple times um <laughs> and it definitely has happened there's a couple of goofy videos that you could find somewhere on on Facebook of 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 the three of us making music actually I think there might be one with my wife playing clarinet too where we're like playing a Christmas, all really Christmas play. song or something <laughs> Uh, that took some convincing though. Beth, <laughs> Beth hadn't been playing clarinet for, uh, many, many years since college, I don't think. And, uh, so yeah, we, we do that. We do that some and it's, and it's fun. That is so awesome. <laughs> um, I think you talk about this a little bit, but you know, what draws you to do this type of thing? What draws you to music? You know, you're doing all these other things. You have personal life, family. What, why do you keep coming back to this? Um, I mean, I guess one of the reasons why I keep coming back to it is, is, uh, it's always an adventure. Um, you know, there's always something new. I mean, I was saying earlier that I really like variety and, um, when you're doing music and being a freelance musician, um, there's all sorts of variety that happens. I mean, um, I mean, just for instance, like even here in Rochester, like I've been able to play with, um, like the 10,000 maniacs when they came to town, or I've been able to play with like the Buckinghams when they came to town or Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. And, um, you know, so you can do some of those like shows with, with thousands of people at them that are just exciting and, and, um, different from what you might do on a day-to-day basis, but also you can just do a lot of 
smaller intimate things like maybe I'm doing a duo at the Redwood Room which I do frequently and that has its own kind of um you know joy and, and pleasure of just creating some improvised music right there and and connecting with people on a more intimate level so just that variety of like being in different situations um and and sometimes maybe not knowing exactly you know like when you get hired to play for the 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 bathroom grand opening in someone's house which happened once you know it's like you're like well I don't really know what this is I don't know how this is going to go exactly but let's give it a shot let's see what's going to happen you know or like um during the pandemic I was playing with uh my band Loudmouth Brass um and we did a show at, at Cook Park in October and we were like using some some grant funds and doing a community event so people could be outside and, and spaced out and of course, the day that we were supposed to do it starts snowing. And so, you know, and it's like, well, okay, let's, okay, we're just going to do this in the snow or, you know, and, and, you know, just that playing in the cold and the snow, it's just, it's just an exciting adventure. Like you don't know necessarily always what's going to happen and you do your best to, um, you know, make the situation enjoyable for everybody that's involved. And I, I like that process. Yeah, playing in a bathroom grand opening seems like yeah. probably one of the more interesting things that you've done, yeah, <laughs> or random, was, I would say. Yeah, that was a one-off. I haven't been, maybe I didn't do a good job because I haven't been asked to do any other bathroom grand openings, but if you're out there and you need a bathroom grand opening, I'm I'm happy, I'm happy to do it. Um, that is, that is hilarious. <laughs> hey, whatever you want in life, right? Um, yeah. So like you said, you've been involved in the music scene here for a long time, very passionate about it. Um, what should people know about the local music scene in Rochester? How can they best support what's going on in the community now? Yeah, um, I think that, uh, you know, there is a lot of music that's happening now. I mean, and I think that to some extent, um, newcomers to the scene maybe sometimes think like, Oh, you know, it's, it's, it, there's more and more of it. And to some extent that's true. There is more and more music opportunities, but also I think some of it is just like learning about the opportunities that have always been there and that continue. And when you're a newcomer to the scene, it takes a while to like, just figure out what, what your options are. You know, I mean, I, I, I think that there is something for everyone in this, um, the musical scene in Rochester, you know, we've got, um, orchestras and we've got, you know, punk bands and we've got electro synth bands and we've got rap groups. And I mean, there's like any kind of music that you are interested in, it seems like is kind of happening here in Rochester. Um, you know, I think one thing that it needs to maybe start changing, or I would like to see changing is getting more of a, a sense of like, um, music is a commodity that is worth supporting with your dollars. And I think right now, like a lot of businesses understand that. And like when a band is being hired by, um, you know, a brewery or a, a restaurant or whatever, they, they totally get the value that they're getting out of that. But a lot of times, like we don't have a lot of bars, say, that have cover charges for a band or, um, you know, we're starting to get more like ticketed shows. Like there's some great groups out there, like My Town, My Music, who are, trying to, to make some um, ticketed shows happening, but more of an awareness, like just of, of everyday people that, Hey, if I want like quality music in my town, I need to be willing to like buy a ticket or pay a cover charge or, or whatever. Um, and like more like mid range venues, I think would be um, important for us to have, you know, not like the huge, like civic center um, theater, but a, a medium sized room, like maybe that's at, uh, the castle right now or some more things like that, you know, and that there's been some awesome shows put on there. I mean, and I can't say enough about just like the support that, you know, like local breweries have provided for, for music, you know, um, at little thistle and, and thesis and, um, Kinney Creek and forager and all these, the, all those places are like really supporting, a variety of music. Um, so I would encourage people to get out and, and, you know, see those, see those, those places. And then also just like realize that like, um, you know, you don't have to go to like Minneapolis or whatever to see a show. Um, you know, there's awesome music here in town that, that you can see. And uh, some of it is, is 
incredible and you need to check it out for yourself. Absolutely. So I have some final questions to wrap us up here. Hopefully fun ones, not, not super serious um, that I've been asking everybody this season. So uh, I'll start out with the first one. Very random. Um, What is your favorite pizza topping? What's your topping of choice? Uh, Well, it it has to be one. I can only say one. Oh, why not? Just I like couple. <laughs> I like the I like the pineapple bacon combo, but not nice. like Canadian bacon, like bacon crumbles. That's my favorite pizza topping. Pineapple, a little sweet and a little saltiness in there. That's what I like. Nice. You were the first person to say pineapple. My favorite is actually pineapple and green olives. Like oh, that is <laughs> That's like the veg. That's kind of like the vegetarian version of what I'm saying, right? Because the because the because the the olives are like salty. You know, you get that salty sweet. Yeah. And then no one will eat my pizza because no one wants it. Uh, that's a good. That's a good strategy. <laughs> it is. All right. What's the last show you binged watched? Oh, actually, I just finished it earlier today, and it was uh, Squid Games. Oh. Okay. Um, which uh, is I don't know. It's like a, a Korean little series and it's kind of like a a hunger game like kind of a a situation where people who are really down on their luck are put in this thing where they play games and then those who are not successful like are shot um it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty dark um i mean like it really kind of speaks to like the uh like is there goodness in humanity still kind of a, a a question but it's interesting for me because it's it was um, uh, overdubbed and uh, I haven't I haven't watched a lot of things like that so it was an interesting um, series to watch for sure. That is one I have not watched at all yet because I'm afraid that I'm just going to keep watching it if I start. Yeah, so. I, would, I recommend it. It's I I, I uh, I've been watching it as I've been been getting my exercise every day. So okay. kind of killing a couple couple birds with one stone there. That's a good way to do it. Um, what's one productivity tool you use in, in any personal life, professional life um, that you think other people should think about using as well? Boy, I don't, I don't have anything that's like super unique there. You know, I mean, just like my, my most utilized tool as a freelance musician um, is the calendar on my phone. Hey. You know, I mean like that, that's like the most, valuable thing that I can't do without. So just like, you know, getting all those dates and stuff organized in some sort of a calendar, which that's a terrible answer to your question, but that's the best I've got. No, not really. I think it's just getting something that works for you and that works for you. And a lot of people don't do that. (laughs) You know, they have it written down in a book or something, who knows? Um, So last question, what's one business entrepreneur, creative, whatever um, in the community that you think everyone should know about? That's a tough question. There's so many good things for people to know about. Um, hmm. Or a um, couple. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, I think uh, maybe one of the, the um, unsung heroes for musicians in Rochester is photographer uh, Kate Klaus, um, who just takes awesome photographs of all kinds of different shows and stuff. Um, and she just really has this awesome niche of doing music photography. She does other photography beautifully, but she really like captures music photography and keeps a good record of um, musical happenings, both here and, and other other places too. But that's definitely a creative person in town that I, I think people should know about. Um, and then, you know, I really am always excited about um, all the video work that uh, Tyler Ogg um, does. He's made a bunch of fun music videos um, that I've been involved with and actually just other silly video projects. Um, we did a, a project last year about downhill, Rochester's Downhill Kayaking Club. Um, <laughs> and uh, we did a project together about... Uh, making paintings out of crow poop um that was part of his documentary i mean and i and I, I, i've always just been kind of excited about the creativity that he exudes as he's creating films i mean there's just a, t- a ton of arts organizations that do awesome things in this town like threshold arts is uh, organization i i can't say enough about with the opportunities that they've created for people um 
one of the things that they worked on that I've been really excited about is the um, uh, opportunity for artists to hang work at the construction site at One Discovery Square. My wife and I, Beth, actually made a proposal together um, and our artwork has been hanging there and it's got magnetic poetry on it. Um, and then it's two big metal panels that are ma a map of Rochester. And my wife made those with encaustic art. And then there's these like little magnets that you can stick on it. Um, so like this, those sorts of artistic opportunities that Threshold Arts has made available for people, I think are, are incredible. And there's a lot of people that I'm, I'm, I'm leaving out and, and um, I just can't, I can't say enough about all the people who are passionate about the arts in Rochester and, and, and making it a vibrant arts community. Yeah. Well, that's my last question for you. I'll ask you for any final thoughts and where's the best place for people um, to learn more about you, the work that you do and connect with uh, where you'll be in the community. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the best place to connect with me is just like on social media, on Instagram and, and Facebook um, for the deceivers specifically, you know, just checking the deceivers Facebook page. We throw up our events for wherever we're going to be playing at every week. So if you're interested about where that group is going to be playing, check out the Facebook page and you'll, you'll, uh, you'll see where we're going to be, be at for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for this conversation today, John. I really appreciate your time. Oh, you too. Thanks for spreading the word about different entrepreneurs and, and everything else in Rochester. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much to John for sharing this wonderful story with us today. You can learn more about John and the Deceivers by checking out the links in our show notes. So thank you so much for spending this time with us today. If you know someone else who would benefit from this conversation, please share this podcast with them. All right, that's a wrap for podcast 250 today. Before you leave, if you enjoyed today's show, please make sure that you're subscribed wherever you like to listen into podcasts and please rate us as well so that other people can find this podcast and learn about the culture of entrepreneurship and small business here in Rochester, Minnesota. Thanks for tuning in and we'll be back next Wednesday with a brand new episode.